So, yeah, this is black one. Good. Okay, any question you have? Um, Wake Forest, will you be able to take the test on December 2nd in the uh, in the evening, like 5.30? No. As anybody else? No, we're no? going to have to take it probably during the day sometime. Okay. So I will I will email the test to you, like not to you but to the uh, to professor, and then you can take it whenever you decide to take it I guess. And same thing about uh, Kunz, right? You can take it at your time. Uh, yes, I should be able to take it that day. Oh, in the in the evening, should should I have the video on? Uh. What time is that? It's 5.30 p.m. I, I, I guess I can make arrangements with you via email. Okay. Okay, fine. So I don't have the room yet. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to find a room for the test. Because I think that's what you asked me. Okay, so what we were doing last time was that we assumed a quadratic form for the um, Helmholtz free energy is quadratic in the strain E and quadratic in the temperature change theta minus theta zero. Yes? Oh, you can't see anything. Oh, let's see. Document camera. Okay. So it works. Good. Thank you. Okay. So what? So we expanded this phi Helmholtz free energy in terms of Taylor series, keeping quadratic terms. And we ended up with an expression for the second Taylor Kauf stress tensor. So this is the initial stress, which we talked about. Like in some cases, you cannot get rid of the residual stress, like in a composite or in a fluid. But in metals, you can anneal the specimen, and you can get rid of the initial stress. So we will assume now that initial stress is zero. Okay. Then the question came up, what is alpha hat? Now, in the book, I don't have a hat there. And so my notation in the class and the book will be opposite of each other. So alpha hat is the stress temperature modulus. And the question comes, how do we find it? What is it equal to? So to find this stress temperature modulus, we look at a, say, free body. So let's say we have a free body means you are not applying any loads to it. <clears throat> and we say heat it up uniformly. Raise the temperature uniformly from theta 0 to, to theta. So what will happen? It will expand. And the expansion will equal the coefficient of thermal expansion times the length, times the temperature change. So the displacement of any point Let's assume we have taken care of the rigid body motion, so it's not going anywhere. This is the coefficient of thermal expansion. That's like change in length per unit length per degree temperature rise. So if I multiply by the coordinate of a point, so I will get the change. So you can think of because this coordinate is from the origin, so you can think of, say, origin is fixed. And if I multiply by the change in temperature, so I should get the expansion, like how much it has increased in length. This is not quite linear expansion because alpha for a composite may or may not be a diagonal matrix. The coefficient of thermal expansion for a composite 
along the fiber is quite different from that transverse to the fiber. That is true for anisotropic materials. Anisotropic means the materials which are not isotropic. Okay? Isotropic means material properties are same in all directions. So anisotropic will be material properties are not same in all directions. Bone is a typical example, but for biomechanics people, the most typical example is the muscles. Our muscles are not isotropic. Okay? They are aligned in a particular directions, and that is to provide strength in that direction. So they are not isotropic, and therefore coefficient of thermal expansion need not be same in all directions. That's why you see alpha A, B, and not a diagonal matrix. So what is strain then? So what will be E? So to find E, we need to find U A, comma say C, that will be alpha A B, delta B C, theta minus theta Z. And that's alpha A C, theta minus theta Z. So E, A B, equal, well twice of this, equals U A comma B, plus U B comma A, plus say u k comma a, u k comma b. That's the definition of green Lagrange strain tensor. Up to here is small strains, and if you have finite strains, then this is the definition, and that's what we have been using for green St. Venant strain tensor. So if, if we substitute this in here, we get alpha a b plus alpha b a, and thus theta minus theta zero plus alpha k a alpha k b theta minus theta zero square. Does it make sense or not? All I'm doing is substituting for the displacement gradient from this expression. Alpha is the coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay, it's a at this time, it is like nine numbers, because it's not necessarily symmetric. So, so what will be the S, the stress? So S A B, we, we found last time that S A B equals this. So C A B, N P, E N P plus alpha A B hat theta minus theta zero. So let's substitute for E. Does it make sense? So we took a free body. By free body, we mean there are no loads acting on it. And I think we when we talked about Newton's first law of motion, we defined a free body. A free body is one there is no force acting on it, neither body force nor surface tractions. Okay. So, so what will be the stress in the free body? Well, if I uniformly heat it. What will be the stress in a free body if we uniformly heat it? Is my question making sense? Like I take a bar of steel, put it in the furnace, not that it melts, but just like put it in the furnace, say at 300 degrees centigrade. So what will be the stress in the bar? There should be zero stress. There should be zero correction. stress because you are not really, it's not constrained anywhere. So I should get zero because we have a free body. So zero should equal then C, A, B, N, P, and E, N, P is this quantity. So that's alpha, 
एम पी प्लस अल्फा पी एन थीटा माइनस थीटा जीरो प्लस अल्फा के एन अल्फा के पी थीटा माइनस थीटा जीरो स्क्वेयर प्लस अल्फा ए बी हैट थीटा माइनस थीटा जीरो so this equation good should be good should be valid for all values of theta minus theta zero this equation should be valid for all values of theta minus theta zero and therefore we can get alpha hat so alpha hat ab equals cab एन पी अल्फा एन पी प्लस अल्फा पी एन प्लस अल्फा के एन अल्फा के पी थीटा माइनस थीटा जीरो बिकॉज यू कैन डिवाइड बाई थीटा माइनस थीटा जीरो ओ माइनस साइन माइनस साइन साइन इज आई थिंक यू सेट ब्रैकेट ओ यस यस यू आर राइट यस ऑल ऑफ दिट शुड बी मल्टीप्लाइड बाई सी एस थैंक्स यस यस फ्रांस Why didn't we put in the one half when we put in the AB? Oh, I did not put that one half either. So that's another problem. So I should put. Oh, uh, let's see. Where does it? Where should it go? It should go here. Yes, you are right. Okay. now generally we assume alpha is symmetric it's an assumption there is no reason for it yet or i cannot really give you any reason so if alpha is symmetric yes why why is just that one term divided by 2 not the other not one? the other one probably the other one should be 2 yeah <laughs> yes the other one should be also so if alpha is symmetric that's an assumption now if we assume that alpha is symmetric so alpha n p equals alpha p n that's an assumption that means we have now six coefficients of thermal expansion rather than nine If alpha is symmetric, then we will have six coefficients of thermal expansion rather than nine. Typically, the value of coefficient of thermal expansion typically is of the order of 10 to the power minus five or minus six centimeter per centimeter per degree C. typically is 10 to the minus 5 10 to the minus 6 of that order of magnitude i think some of you probably jessica you might be you might have measured it i don't know for coefficient of thermal expansion for a fiber say okay is typically in the range of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6 cm per cm or meter per meter per degree c or per degree kelvin if you say uh, fahrenheit then you have to divide by 1.8 but we are talking about order of magnitude we are not giving the exact value so if this is true if it is of the order of 10 to the minus 6 what will be the magnitude of this term so we turn to the minus 12 and this one is turn to the minus 6 
we are not going to raise the temperature by a million. Right? There is, actually, our theory is not applicable. Our theory is applicable only when theta is slightly different from theta zero, because we, we expanded things in terms of Taylor series and kept quadratic terms. So our theory is not applicable if you change the temperature by a lot. So, so we can neglect this term. So we can say then that alpha a, b hat is nearly equal to minus c, a, b, n, p, alpha n, p. So if you know the Young's modulus, and if you multiply that by the coefficient of thermal expansion, then you get this stress temperature modulus. So the value of the stress temperature modulus is not small, because Young's modulus is pretty big. It's in GPAs. So, so if the Young's modulus in GPA, which means like 10 to the power what, nine pascals, and this is 10 to the power minus six pascals. So we are talking about like kilopascals per, per degree Celsius. So alpha hat has the magnitude of kilopascals um, per degree Celsius. So if you raise the temperature by 100 degrees, you are going to induce a stress of roughly one-tenth of a megapascal, which is not very large. It depends upon the material, of course. Right? But if you have a carbon nanotube, then C, Young's modulus for a carbon nanotube is a terapascal, roughly. So that will mean 10 to the power 12. And if you, I don't know the coefficient of thermal expansion for a carbon nanotube, but let's assume it is the same as, for a, as that for a carbon fiber. Then we are talking about 10 to the power 12 times 10 to the minus 6. So we are talking about megapascals per degree Celsius. So you can, you can induce significant stresses in a carbon nanotube if you raise the temperature by, by a few degrees. So if you, there's a talk, I mean, there's a proposal, or people are thinking or dreaming that we can put some medicine on carbon nanotube and we can treat it with some enzymes so that if I swallow it, or if a human being swallows it, then somehow it is directed towards the right place in, a, in the organ, say for cancer treatment. If, the term, if you drink hot coffee immediately after swallowing the carbon nanotube, you may induce considerable stresses in it. Well, that's what it says here, right? Because nanotube is not freely in the, is floating around in the body now. I mean, once it is in the body, it is surrounded by tissue. So, and the coefficient of thermal expansion of the tissue and the nanotube may be different. Of course, Young's modulus is totally different. So there can be. I'm not saying there will be. Will be is different from can be. Okay, so... The next question is then, what is the entropy? So we go back to our, this expansion we had of the free energy, Helmholtz free energy, and what is entropy in terms of Helmholtz free energy? So the entropy inequality said that eta, that's the specific entropy or entropy per unit mass, oh, there are two quantities in the literature I think we, we should be careful about. One is called something per unit mass, and other is something per unit volume. So if you measure something per unit volume, then that's density, like mass density is mass per unit volume. If you measure something per unit mass, then that is specific. So, so this is specific entropy. Because this is being measured per unit mass. 
and we found this was minus delta phi over delta theta. So rho zero eta, because we expanded this in terms of rho zero. So if I differentiate, I get a, that's the first term, and then I will get b theta minus theta zero, and we will get plus alpha L m hat E L. And oh, everything, yeah, it's negative. You are right. So I goofed. So let me put minus here and minus here. Then I can. It's the same thing when I. Yeah. Okay, now let's uh, simplify the expression we had. We had phi equal to e minus eta theta. But I'm going to I'm headed towards the following. We know we know the balance of internal energy. So that's where I'm headed. So I'm going to get a term equation for the temperature. Balance of internal energy says rho zero e dot equals minus q l comma l plus t i l f dot i l plus rho zero r. That's the balance of internal energy. We derived this. Oh, I don't know. Some time ago. No, probably three weeks ago. So I'm going to substitute for e dot here, from this one and this one. That's where I'm headed, and that will give us the equation for temperature. <laughs> so, so if we take this and differentiate it, so we get phi dot, which is really delta phi over delta theta theta dot. Plus delta phi over delta f i l f dot i l equals e dot minus eta theta dot minus eta dot theta by the chain rule. But this term cancels with that. Therefore, e dot equals theta eta dot plus this is T i l over rho zero f i l dot delta phi i over delta this quantity is the first Kolar Kopff's test tensor. I mean, that again was given by entropy inequality, except that rho zero times this was first Kolar Kopff's test tensor, so that's why we are dividing by rho zero here. Is it okay? Therefore, rho zero e dot equal rho zero theta eta dot plus T i l f dot i l. And now I substitute in this equation. So what do we get? So I have rho zero theta eta dot is right here, and. Actually, I have for rho zero eta dot, rho zero eta. So let me scratch this. So I have theta. Can I ask a question real quick yeah, before sure. you go forward? So I think when you were writing the line up earlier, you said that the 
TIL was the first peel of Kirchhoff. Right. And so, is it, okay, never mind. I think we derived yeah. TIL equal rho zero delta phi over delta FIL. The entropy inequality gave us this relation. Okay, then I guess I'm um, You're confused. confused. About when, from before, I guess when you've been writing the first peel of Kirchhoff, you've all been oh. over top, and so. Yeah, yeah. So my notation is bad, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I think I'm, well, no excuse. It's my mistake, yes. Yeah, I should have a tilde on it, yes. Yeah, thank you. It's my mistake, yes. I should have a tilde on it. Okay. Yes, you were right. Okay, so now let's substitute for E dot, this quantity. So we get theta rho zero eta dot. So let's differentiate this. A is a constant. So this time derivative is zero. So we get B theta dot. And now I need to be careful about my signs. So I should have a minus B And minus alpha L M at E L M dot. Okay, plus P I L tilde F dot I L should equal minus Q L comma L plus T I L tilde F dot I L plus rho zero. And now we are in business, I think. So we are getting the heat equation now, and that's, that's the goal. So this term cancels with this one. So what we get then is if you change this sign, well, let's say minus b theta theta dot equals minus q l comma l plus rho zero r plus alpha l m hat theta e l m dot. The reason I still have minus b is because b is going to be negative quantity. And I, I, of course, if I had put minus b, when I expanded this in terms of Taylor series, if I had put minus b here, then I would have gotten a plus b here. So that's where the, I mean, but anyway, it, our algebra is correct if we, you know, So this is the equation that gives us the temperature, rate of change of temperature, theta dot. When you are not quite used to it, well, first of all, let's look at QL, which we have not simplified yet. And what is the physical, what is this term coming from? Or what is the meaning of this term? R is the supply of energy because of radiation, like you are sitting in the sun. So R is the energy you are receiving per unit mass from the sun. R from bodies which are not touching you. Q is the energy you are receiving from bodies that are touching you, like heat conduction. This term is the working, that means rate of work done due to thermal stresses. Alpha is the stress temperature modulus. If you multiply it by temperature, you will get stress. And if you 
dotted with E dot, you will get the working. So what you really get is alpha L hat theta, you get a second Kirchhoff's test tensor because that was the way, that's the way we derived it. So you see, yes, second Kirchhoff's test tensor is related to alpha hat times the, times the temperature change. So this quantity, alpha hat theta, is the second Kirchhoff's test tensor. It's dotted with E dot, dotted means taking this inner, taking this inner product or scalar product in vectors of six dimensional space. Okay, now, what about the heat flux? Yes. Is there some sort of convection term? Convection? That will come in through the boundary, boundary conditions. Okay. See, convection, like, I think it's, it's a good question. In summer, when we get hot, we sit in front of a fan, and that's to cool ourselves off. So what is happening is the fan is blowing air on us, and that air is extracting heat from the surface of the body. So that will come through the boundary condition. Also, one can, one can receive heat through the surface. Like I, I can cover myself or I can wear dark clothes. And if I wear dark clothes on a sunny day, the coefficient of absorption of those dark clothes, generally speaking black clothes, is much higher than that of white clothes. So, so you wear, if you want to receive more heat from the sun on a sunny day, wear black clothes and sit in the sun. Then you will feel warmer than if you wear white clothes. Of course, you can wear uh, aluminum foil that will reflect waves, then you won't feel much energy. So it's, it's all up to you. Okay, now what about the heat flux, QL? So we said Q is also a function of E and theta and G with the condition that the entropy inequality says that if the temperature gradient is zero, then the heat flux is zero. If the temperature gradient is zero, then the heat flux must be zero. That was what we derived from the entropy inequality. We cannot have a heat flux in the absence of temperature gradient. So we expand this in terms of Taylor series. Same way as we did, same way as we did for the free energy, we expand heat flux in terms of Taylor series. The only difference is we are going to keep terms linear. We are going to keep terms of first order in, in the temperature change and first order in the temperature gradient change. So we get QL of E, theta, and G equals QL, there is nothing here, E is zero in the reference configuration, theta is theta zero, G is a G zero. So that's the first term in the Taylor series. And if we Take the next one, we are going to expand in terms of say E now. So we will get plus or minus is your choice. So this is E L M N, sorry, A L M N, E M N. Say plus. It's common convention to put minus here. So it's K L M G M minus G M zero. So that's expanding in terms of G. And then let's expand in terms of temperature change. So that's BL theta minus theta zero. And remember now A, K, and B, this, these three quantities, they are evaluated in the reference configuration. So they are constants now. A is a third order, like it has three indices, 
K has two indices, B has one index. So K is called thermal conductivity. I think we have said that before. So K is the thermal conductivity tensor because tensor because we have it has two indices now. So now we need to satisfy this constraint. Entropy inequality cannot be violated. The second law of thermodynamics cannot be violated. So if I set heat flux equal to zero, that means this term is zero. So these two must be zero then. So if there's no heat flux, I should, if there's no temperature gradient, I should not get any heat flux. But these two terms don't have any temperature gradient in them. So, so this A then must be zero and B must be zero. There is no, yes, uh, Katie, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, no, I didn't hear. Okay. What are A and B equal to? It's a good point. So B L is delta Q L over delta theta evaluated at theta E is zero, theta is theta zero, G is G zero. And what's A equal to? And what do these mean, um, like, in a real sense? In the real sense, actually, what it says is, how much heat flux will you get if you if you strain the body? How much heat flux will you get if you change the temperature of the body? So B means how much heat flux will you get if you change the temperature of the body? A means how much heat flux we will get if you strain the body, and the answer is zero because entropy inequality says you cannot get heat flux unless you change the temperature gradient. But math requires that I expand this in terms of Taylor series, and that's what I did because we have three variables here, so we will get three terms. Q is a function of three variables, E, theta, and G. So if you expand in terms of Taylor series, you will get three terms. And we are not keeping the higher order term. The higher order term will be like E square, G square, theta square, and then cross multiply. And the reason we are not keeping the higher order terms is because in our stress strain law, we have only terms which are linear in E and linear in theta minus theta zero. So it's not fair, it's not a fair game to keep linear terms in the stress strain law and keep higher order terms in the heat flux. Unless, unless you are really in a space shuttle and facing the sun, and then the heat flux is very high. So you will get a better approximation if you keep higher order terms. However, for things that we are considering now, we are saying temp change in temperature is not very high, relative change in temperature is not very high, but if you are very close to the sun, like if you are in space 50, 60 miles from Earth, the amount of radiation you are receiving that you mentioned from the sun is pretty high, and the, that's why on the space shuttle, you have ceramic tiles on the outer surface so that the, the material can withstand high temperatures. It doesn't melt. If you had steel or aluminum, it might melt. And then our colleagues will not be able to come back. Okay? So, so that's why we keep, we use ceramic tiles on the outer surface so that it can withstand the high temperature. Does that help? Okay, so this A is zero because of the intro, because when you set G equal to zero, you should get heat flux as zero. This has no heat, no G term, this has no G term. So, now if we assume that the bodies, that the, in the reference configuration, the bodies at a uniform, is at a uniform temperature. 
So if, if the body is at a uniform temperature in the reference configuration, then there is no temperature gradient in the reference configuration. So what will happen to this term? So if there is no temperature gradient, what will happen to this term? Well, here is the rule. No temperature gradient, no heat flux. So Q in the reference configuration will be 0 too. So from now onwards, we are going to say that our reference configuration, the stress is 0, and temperature is uniform. So in the reference configuration, the stress is 0, so there is no residual stress. And Fred is out of business because he's testing composites, and there is no way he can achieve that. There is no way in the composite you can have residu zero residual stress. But you can have uniform temperature. So if we make these two assumptions, then what we get is that SAB is CAB NP ENP plus alpha hat AB theta minus theta zero and QL is minus KLM GM, which is same thing as KLM theta comma M. So it's the temperature gradient with respect to coordinates in the undeformed state. K is the thermal conductivity. We are dealing with anisotropic bodies. Material properties are directional dependent. <coughs> Material properties are directional dependent. OK, so now, so with this, what are our balance laws? So first thing we get from this equation then is minus B theta, theta dot equals k l m theta comma m comma l plus rho zero r plus alpha <coughs> l m hat theta e dot. This is e dot. No, I don't know. It's not, nothing to do with l, this l. Maybe I should put this, this goes here. It's E dot LM. I think what you probably have come across before is heat conduction in a rigid body. In that case, you have denoted this term evaluated in the reference configuration at the reference temperature. So this is specific heat. Minus B times theta is specific heat. K is thermal conductivity, which I think you have seen before. Most of the time you take radiation R term to be zero. And if the body is rigid, there is no strain. So E dot is zero. So you get the classical heat equation. Now you get specific heat times rate of change of temperature equals the divergence of the heat flux. So this is the equation for temperature, except we have a coupling now, because E depends upon displacements. So if the body can deform, then E depends upon displacement. What about the equilibrium stress equation, like conservation of linear momentum? So we, d we wrote rho 0 ui double dot, which is the acceleration. And this time I will remember, so Francis doesn't have to correct me. I will put tilde on it, plus rho 0 pi. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot the tilde, I and mean, I should remember this. And 
when I realize if you make a mistake, you lose a point, but if I'm making a mistake, I don't lose anything. Except on my teaching evaluation, you can write something. Okay, so what is TIL? TIL tilde is F I M S M L. Because we defined S as F inverse T tilde. We defined S as F inverse T tilde. So, and what is F? F is delta I M plus U I M S M L. F is displacement, F is deformation gradient. It's delta little x i over delta big X, which is equal to Kronecker delta plus, we denoted this by H, R is a displacement gradient. Because now we are writing everything in terms of displacements. Okay, so if you agree with that, then we have delta I M plus u i comma m. Now we need to substitute for s. And s s is this quantity. But now we are taking s a b 0 to be 0. So, so it's C, M, L, N, P times E, N, P plus alpha hat oh, M, L, theta minus theta zero. So this bracket closed, and then the outer bracket closed, comma L, plus rho zero BI. And I think this time I, I was awake. So at TI tilde is this quantity. So the first term, I copied here. Then for S, I copied these two terms. They are right here. Sorry, Fred, is, is it okay? So those S is here. And then you take the divergence, which means differentiate with respect to L, plus rho zero B i. So these give us these two equations. If you want to solve a thermoelasticity problem, if you want to solve a problem, a couple prob coupled thermomechanical problem, a coupled thermomechanical problem, then these are the two equations we need to solve. These are the four equations actually. For i equal to for i equal to 1, 2, and 3. So we have three equations in displacements and one for temperature. So how many unknowns do we have? In a thermomechanical problem, Katie is thinking, so she is going to tell us, how many unknowns do we have in a thermomechanical problem? You know what I mean by thermomechanical or thermoelastic problem? Thermo means a temperature. Elastic means a elastic body. So how many unknowns do we have in a thermoelastic body? 
Kim. Jessica. Catherine at Wake Forest will help us. Catherine? Nine. I have no idea. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> it's got to be four. It's got to be four. See, it is four. There are three components of displacement. There are three components of displacement. That's all we have been studying for the last 15 weeks, that a continuous body has three components of displacement. And now it has also temperature, because we are saying thermoelastic. So to find the deformed state of a body, we have to find four things. Displacement of each point, three components of displacement, and one temperature now. So if you are solving a mechanical problem, purely mechanical problem, then we have three components of displacement. If you are solving a coupled thermomechanical problem, then we have four. If you are solving an electromechanical problem, which we have not talked about, then you need electrical potential. So you again will have four. If you have thermoelectromechanical problem, then you have electric potential, temperature, and three components of displacement. But then we need one more equation. How many equations do we have here? I will quit. I, I realize I'm two minutes over time. So, but how many equations are in this box I, I put in? Hey, I mean, you are so you are tired, right? But four. Very good. Four. This is scalar equation for temperature. There are three equations here for i equal to one, two, and three. So there are three equations here. So we have four equations for four unknowns. Are these equations linear? Are these equations linear? The answer is yes or no. They are not N O T not. They are not linear. The ones we have derived are not linear because you can see theta multiplying with the E. E is displacement. E has displacements in it. E itself is quadratic in displacements. And you see E here multiplying with U. So these equations are not linear. These equations account for large strains. Strain can be very large. You can pull my skin. This is a co considered. However, the stress-strain relation is linear. So stress is a linear function of no, like finite strains. OK, so I will see you tomorrow. And thank you. So I think we have only one more class to make up. Yeah, thank you for letting me make up the class. You probably would have been happier if we did not make it up.
I can just give it tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. Otherwise, I have to carry it home and then bring it back. Okay. I'll... I think it's due tomorrow, right? But due on the first. It's due on the first. Give me on the first then. Okay. Is that way I will. It's not that I will lose it. But if you give me today, then I have to carry it home and bring it back. So I'd rather you carry it. Okay. Uh, when is everybody meeting? Okay. Oh, I want this right now. I just got out of class. Okay, well, you guys do that later. Or you do that later. Yeah, I, I couldn't decide where to go. Okay. I'm going to go grab dinner on campus after here, but then I realized it might be like 7.35 or 8.30. No, I guess I'm, I'm doing good. Um... All right, well, then I'll go ahead and grab some food. And then if we're studying at your place, I can just walk there. But hey, if Paul, everybody's studying at Brian's, would you mind, like, swinging by and grabbing me? So, um, <laughs> awesome. I'm really you, but um, <laughs> there, I, I need to get a lot done before Friday. I really can't. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Cause, yeah, dinner shouldn't take that long. But I'm, I'm going to bring my games on a lot so, I need four seconds. Okay, great. Just give me a call. I'll bring them. Okay, well, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Yeah. All right, I'm good for dinner. Okay. If you are, um, I just need to go get my stuff now. Get my stuff. My vibration stuff from Norse. That way, because um, Max may pick me up from campus. So.